Good morning. I'm glad that uh, you are tuning in through uh, either Facebook Live or through um, YouTube Live. We are here at First Baptist Church, or I am here with my son Jonathan. We are here uh, just enjoying our, I guess, our time together, but I wanted to come into your lives today and speak uh, about Easter today. Easter is an important time. I'll tell you that uh, during this time of coronavirus, we don't know what's going to happen. and Things are going every which way. And uh, my wife, I wanted to show you, she made me a mask so I can put on if I need to when I go out. Uh, she made it and uh, made each one of us a mask. And so we now have masks and everything to, to be able to be safe and to be responsible, I guess, as we deal with this pandemic. It's, it's been really an interesting time and a difficult time. And there's some ideas that I have about how we're going to meet together, maybe, uh, maybe do some different things. But I wanna, I'll, I'll be sharing those with you this week, probably. Um, and some new ways of uh, being able to fellowship together. Uh, but today we want to talk about Easter. It's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the start, of course, the Easter week of when Jesus uh, was crucified upon the cross for our sins, uh, that gave us the hope of eternal life and rose again from the dead uh, as an evidence of his uh, conquering death and sin in our life. And so I wanted you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me this morning, and I want to uh, just encourage you this morning to uh, look at uh, verses uh, 12 through 26. We're going to read verses 12 through 26. If you follow along with me in your copy of God's Word. It says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, and by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But in each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then his coming to those who belong to Christ, then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must rule, he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. For the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Let me pray. Father, I pray that as we look at your word this morning, I pray that it would be an encouragement to us during this time. We pray for all those who are suffering from the virus today. We pray for the healing of those people that are, are in dire circumstances because of the coronavirus or any virus for that matter. But we also realize, Father, that we suffer from something greater, sin. And Father, we, we ask for your forgiveness today. We ask that you would forgive us of our many trespasses, our sins, and that, Father, that we would be able to, to orchestrate all things according to your glory. Father, forgive us, make us whole, deliver us from the power and the presence and the penalty of sin, that we might walk with you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So today I've titled my message, Getting the Final Word. And I want you to just ask you a question this morning about um, arguments you have, maybe discussions you have. You may have discussions and a person is determined that you have a discussion with to get the final word. 
And then if I ask you, do you know anybody like that? And you may say, oh, I know someone like that. She lives in my house or he lives in my house. It's my wife or my husband. And you say he or she must always, always have the last word. The discussion or debate is never over until then. And some of you feel the need to always get the last word. Uh, a friend of mine told me one time that <clears throat> when, he, when he met his wife, he said, I always have to get the final word, the final word in any argument. And his wife said, okay. What he came to find out that during his marriage that his final words were most likely, yes, dear, whatever you want. Another friend of mine talked about how they deal with arguments and things in his marriage and uh, was, was dealing with things like that. But another one talked to me about an argument he had with a notorious cable company. And the cable company did something that he, he thinks was absolutely wrong. His, the service was not good and he wanted some sort of accommodation or refund. And the cable company said, no way, we're not doing it. Whether you like it or not, we're not budging a bit. And I said to my friend, ah, I, I guess they, they got the final word on you. And he said to them, no, 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 he didn't. He said, no, no. I told them then, uh, cancel my subscription. I'm going to satellite. And I said to, to him, I said, well, I guess then you got the final word. And he said, no, no, no. They got the final word because they own the satellite company. Yeah, that might be funny to us and think about that, but um, we like to have the final word in things. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think Paul's dealing with the resurrection that I think is the final word to Christianity. It's the exclamation point. It's the, it's the final word about anything and everything, whether Christianity is true or not. You see, it's impossible to be a Christian and to deny the resurrection. It's impossible. If you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're just not a Christian. It is vital, and without it, there are dastardly consequences. Look at some of the consequences of denying the resurrection. Number one, Jesus is not alive if you deny the resurrection. Preaching is futile. What I do is futile. It's worthless. It's, it's nothing. Uh, the Bible says that our faith is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans. The apostles that we read about in the Bible were all false witnesses. And one of the gravest things that we have in our life is that we're still in our sins. We are still in sin, and that has not been solved in our life and our relationship with God. And those that are lost or those who have died are, have fallen asleep, are dead, are gone for good, are lost. And so this morning, as you think about this, the world looks at us and pities us because they think that's the way it works. But that's not the last word. I was reading some last words of people this week that may have been interesting to you, interesting to me. I was just thinking about what, what do people say when they're on their deathbed, when they're, when they're going to say the last things they say in life. Ed, Edwin Gwynn, who played Santa Claus on the Miracle on 34th Street, was asked by someone uh, close to him if dying was tough. He said, yes it is, but comedy is far tougher. Those were his last words. When Karl Marx was at the edge of his death, his housekeeper asked him if he had any last words. He said, go on, get out. Last words are for fools who have not said enough. When General John Sedgwick, a Union commander, was told the enemy was stationed not too far away, he dismissed the report. And he said, they couldn't hit an elephant at that this... And right in the middle of that word, he died without finishing his sentences. Those were his last words. Lady Nancy Astor awoke briefly at the final stages of her ill terminal illness. And when she saw that her friends and family had gathered around her, she said, Am I dying? Or is this my birthday? Those were her last words. Joan Crawford lay on her deathbed and it was reported that her maid began to pray and she, said, she tried to stop her and said, Don't you dare ask God to help me. We all need to get the last word in. 
Last words are some of the most important things that people say. It tells about their life. And we live in a world that thinks they have gotten the last word. We live in a world today that before this coronavirus thought that everything was perfect, that things would go along swimmingly and sail swimmingly in life because really we are doing really well. We have a lot of comforts, we have a lot of things going on well in our life. But this virus and things realize that we are feeble people. We are not in control of our destinies. And we do not have the last word over everything that happens to us in our life. We plan for all sorts of things, but we don't have the last word. You see, next week is Easter. Next week is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Next week is Palm Sunday. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Uh, they, were, they were hailing him as Savior. Uh, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And next week, where are they to be found? But Easter is going to change everything because it's the resurrection day. And that is the day we celebrate the fact that over 2,000 years ago, next week we're going to celebrate it, that our founder, our leader, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, did something that had never been done before in the entire life, in the entire time of the world. After dying, dying a di violent death because of Roman soldiers on a Roman cross, he laid in a cold, dark grave. And all his enemies believed that they had the last words. It was over. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because on that third day, the stone was rolled away. And Jesus of Nazareth emerged alive and victorious. Oh, how wonderful that is. Just think about that. That Jesus conquered death. Jesus did that. Because he says if, if Jesus hadn't been risen from the dead, it said in our text this morning, it says those that have fallen asleep sleep have perished or are really dead. They have no hope. If there is not a resurrection, they have no hope of life eternal. They have no hope of coming back. There is something different that is going on. But Jesus, in fact, did so. You know, you are here this morning because of the resurrection. You're joining me from your homes, watching on your phones, your tablets, your computers. During this time of pandemic, during this time of, 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 of uh, social distancing, you're, you're, we're, we're doing all that and we're trying to work this all out and we're trying to figure out what life means and what it's going to be. I mean, our economy is doing one thing and that has to come back because we've got to make a living and we're, we're, we're weighing all these different things. But you're here today because I believe of the resurrection. You are here watching because of the resurrection. There's no one here, of course, but you're watching because of that. And we're not here to honor a dead man. We're not watching to honor a dead man. We're not listening to honor someone who's died or merely a good teacher. We're here to honor the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Easter morning is proof that all those things that might have the last word, don't have the last word. It's all because of the resurrection. Today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15, some of those verses that I just read to you in which Paul talks at length about the significance of that resurrection. In an ancient world, most people believed in a pseudo spiritual resurrection. In other words, it wasn't really a physical resurrection, but their disembodied souls would go up to another plane. And they would live in a different environment or a different plane of existence. Um, I'm reminded of Star Trek. I'm reminded of Star Wars where people would, would, would embody uh, vessels and different things. I'm reminded of the Borg or different existences that, that people think they would have. Um, but what happened in this life, they were not concerned about because it had no relationship to the life to come. And this kind of thinking has crept into, the, crept into the church in the early centuries. 
or at least in the, in the Jewish temple in the early centuries, there were some who did not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ because to them, in their worldview, it was impossible for someone to rise from the dead. And so they made up ideas that it was a ghostly resurrection or Jesus really never died. He may have seemed to die or it was a different kind of resurrection. But I want to tell you that Paul said something differently in our text. Paul says, he, he, he asked the question, if, if it didn't happen, what would we be in? What would the situation would be in? And it would be start, but then he said, if in fact, Christ did raise from the dead. He emphasized that Christ physically rose from the dead, not just spiritually or ghostly or in appearance-wise or in a different plane. And then he said his bodily resurrection was so important that he, on Friday he was physically dead. Physically dead. And then on Sunday he was physically, bodily alive. That's such a wonderful news. Again, it was the physical body. And it was more than a mere earthly body that was resurrected. It was a resurrected body made alive by the Spirit of God. A body that would never experience death again because every enemy, we're going to find out, had been conquered. And Paul said, Christ is the first to experience this miraculous resurrection and all who followed him will experience it one day, someday. The physical resurrection is a foundational doctrine in the Christian life because of what it means. It's foundational. We said you can't deny it. It means, first of all, that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is God. He is your creator. He is your Lord, Redeemer, and Savior. He claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. He claimed to be the only way someone can have a relation with the Father, that all other religions are false. That the resurrection proves that apart from Christ and what he says and what he has revealed in his word, all other religions are a false religion. The resurrection also means there is nothing in this world with greater power than the power of Jesus Christ. He is the final word. Not even death can hold him down. Coronavirus can't do it. I don't care what you're going through today. There is no power that Jesus Christ can't, no power on this earth that, that, is, that Jesus Christ's power can't overcome. He is the sovereign. Every molecule obeys his command. Whether actively or passively, every person is in his sovereign realm. He can control the, the kings and the countries, and he, he molds them as he wills. His plan does not fail. When you believe in the resurrection, everything changes. Your world changes. Your worldview changes. You perceive the world completely different around you. You see, we perceive the world as, some people perceive the world as uh, their last hope. But as Christians, we don't perceive it as, as our last hope in this world. We perceive that the best worldview in, in light of all this is a new heaven and a new earth. We wait eagerly for that time when a new heaven and new earth will be created. What a wonderful thing we have is in a Christian worldview. See, a Christian worldview looks at the virus and, and says, well, you know what? We live in a sinful world where there are going to be things that happen to us and no one has ever escaped death. The best medical science in, in a Christian worldview, while we love science and Christians have been involved in science and people in the New York Times and whoever are saying that Christians do, do not believe in science or hinder science, that is an absolute falsity. That is a lie. We believe in science, but we don't believe science can solve every problem because guess what? The grave will conquer everyone in this life. And apart from Jesus Christ, we can conquer the grave. The resurrection has the final word. The resurrection has the final word. Today, let's consider three things, three ideas, three last words that do not have the final word. Number one, Easter means that troubles don't get the final word or the last word. Paul said in his letter to the church, if Christ... If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. That's in verse 19. 
of 1 Corinthians 15. Most to be pitied. Why would he say that? He's not saying that there's nothing good in this life. There's nothing to be joyful about, nothing to find fulfillment or happiness in this life about. He's not saying that. He's not saying there's no answers to prayers, there's no blessings, there's no miracles. But what he's saying is acknowledging that life for a follower and believer of Jesus Christ can be hard, can be tough. And the price to be paid can be high. It can be very high. It can be a hefty price. That's because we all have struggles. But the one thing Christians do is we live by a standard that is beyond ourselves. We live, because of the resurrection, we believe that there's a standard that God has given to us to live by for our benefit. But sometimes in this world, it seems like that it costs us a lot. It's counterintuitive. But let me tell you, we live with an eternal perspective. We, we hope for eternity. We live that this life is not all there is. There is eternity to live for. You see, we forgive when we could seek revenge because of eternal life and the resurrection. We turn the other cheek rather than fight back because Jesus rose again from the dead. We give to those in need instead of spending the money on ourselves because we believe there is more to this life than the things that we have. We sacrifice for the good of others when we could instead look out for number one because we believe that other focus is how Jesus would want us to live. We take a stand for what is right when we could stay quiet with the crowd because we believe there is something to live for. We do these things because we're making an investment in eternity. We believe that we are pilgrims in this world. Where there is no, if there is no eternity, then why make the decisions that can make life only more difficult? You see, when we go through the struggles and toils and turmoil and pain, we need to remind ourselves that our troubles and turmoil and pain do not have the last word. Jesus does. Jesus has the last word because of his resurrection. Even when life is at its worst, we can face each day knowing that the world is not all there is. Jesus got the last word on Easter morning more than 2,000 years ago, and this is why we celebrate. You are watching today. You're joining us today at First Baptist Church at Liberty here as, as, as I am preaching, as I am sharing the word of God to you today because there is something more in this life than just living for now. There's an eternal future in life. So for, first of all, your troubles, your trials, your torments do not have the last word. Jesus does. Secondly, Easter means that sin does not get the last word either. Paul wrote in verses 21 and 22 of our text, For by, as a man came death, for by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The resurrection of Jesus Christ reversed the curse of Adam. When we are born, we are born in Adam. Everyone is born under that curse. We are all guilty of original sin because original sin has been imputed for us from the moment of our conception. We were imputed with original sin. David even said, in, my sin, in sin did my mother conceive me. And so we have this issue of sin in our life. It, it's powerful. It causes a lot of harm. The Bible says because of our disobedience and because of the original sin in our life that causes us to also act out in that original sin, it says all we like sheep have gone astray. Isaiah 53 verse 6. All of us like sheep, we have gone astray. We have turned, we have turned everyone to his own way. In Romans 3 verse 10, the Bible says none is righteous, no, not one. None of us has a relationship with God. Verse 23 of Romans 3 says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God sets the standards, and we've fallen short every single day, every single moment. It's a human dilemma that none of us can escape. We've all sinned. We've all been broken by our sin. And life bears the evidence of our brokenness. Oh, we have brokenness. It's not only the coronavirus that is demonstrating our brokenness. It's, it's, it's also all the things that go on. One presidential candidate one time said that he'd never asked God or needed to ask God uh, or he never asked God for forgiveness. Max Lucado said that that's like asking a swimmer to say, I've never gotten wet. 
or a musician saying, I've never sung a song. Recognizing our need for forgiveness from God and asking for it is right up there at the top of the things that we need to do this Easter. You need to do this Easter. Most people do not try to deny that they have sinned because they can't deny it. You can't deny it. I can't deny it. The evidence is all around us. There are consequences of our bad choices. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray, but then it says in Isaiah 53 verse 6, and the Lord has laid the iniquities of us all on him. In other words, the sin of Adam which was imputed to us has now been imputed to Christ. And for those who believe in Christ, it's wonderful, it's great. This verse means that while on that Friday afternoon when Jesus died on the cross, all your sins of every believer in Jesus Christ that would ever live, every believer was placed upon Christ and he died upon that cross. And he, when he died upon that cross, he paid the penalty for that sin so that you would not be in judgment, that you would be in forgiveness and you would be justified before God. He paid the price, whatever that price was, in, a, in an infinite price it was. As Jesus died on the cross, he said it is finished, paid in full, and that's why we sing. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he has washed me white as snow. There are some today that you're watching today that you know that sin has made a wreck of your life. You are at your last ends. You, things are not going well. Maybe you're, maybe you're struggling during this time of pandemic joblessness. I, I have no idea what you're dealing with. Maybe, the, maybe it's a trail of damaged relationships in your life. Maybe it's havoc in your life. Maybe it's bad choices financially. I don't know what it is. But sin has made such a havoc of your life that you have nowhere else to turn. And I want to give you hope this morning. The hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why John the Baptist proclaimed as he saw Jesus approaching in the desert in John chapter 1 verse 29 he says behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And though it's through his death on the cross Jesus destroyed the penalty of sin and through his resurrection he destroyed the power of sin and one day when he comes back he will destroy the presence of sin. This means that sin, while it had power in your life, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, has no more power. In Romans 6, 14, listen to what it says. For sin shall have no dominion over you. In other words, sin will not be your master like it was before. Since you're not under law but under grace. I like to look for evidence of God's grace all the time because God's grace is powerful than sin. God's grace can overcome sin. God forgives your sin and he starts you on a path to victory. You can have a path of victory in your life today that you have never known before if you really start to follow Christ. If you really believe in Christ, you believe in the resurrection, you believe in what he, who he said he was and what he said he did for you and continues to do for you. Sin will not have the last word Jesus does. Jesus will have the last word. And thirdly, Easter means that no enemy will ever get the last word. Paul said that Jesus will destroy every single last enemy, rule, power, and authority. He said that in verse 24, and then he said in verse 25, he said, For he must reign until he put all his enemies under his feet. Who are his enemies? His enemies are not people. We know from spiritual warfare there are principalities and powers. They're the devil. But there's also evil. There's sin as an enemy. Corruption. Fear. Sickness. Pain. Misery. Jealousy. Greed. Just, just greed and violence that are happening in our society today. Abuse. Hate, just people hating each other. But Paul goes on to say in verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
Isn't that what we fear most? Isn't that the worst enemy of, the, of them all is death? Is that, isn't that what causes more pain? Is, isn't that what makes us feel so vulnerable? Isn't that why this pandemic is so, uh, so scary for so many people? There is so much fear. I'm going to say fear is really faith in the wrong things. Fear is not faith in Jesus. Fear is faith in circumstances. And I want you to have faith in Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To those of you without faith, if you're watching this morning, if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, the world may seem to be just random events. This is another random event happening, leading us ultimately to the grave. The fact is, and let's not pretend otherwise, that we're all headed to the cemetery. There's no doubt about it. But there's good news today. The journey doesn't end there. The graveyard is not your final destination. Death, along with every other enemy we face, does not get the last word. Jesus gets the last word because of his resurrection. The Bible has so much to say about how we are to live in him here and now. And I admit that we should think about how we're going to live in the by and by, in heaven. Because that's what he's promised us. He's promised us an eternal life. Not just in a sweet by and by, but in a physical reality of a new heaven and a new earth. We've seen up close the destruction of cancer. We've seen up close the destruction of, of crime, of war. We've seen destruction of family uh, abuse and, 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 and uh, relationship abuse. We've seen uh, where women have been abused. Just, just all the crimes and the difficulties of life. But it, um, here's a spoiler alert. When we look at the end of the book, at the last book in the Bible, we see how it turns out. In, Rome, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, it says this, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall be there be mourning, crying, or nor pain, for the former things have passed away. Those enemies, including death, are no longer. <laughs> Hallelujah! Isn't that wonderful? Our promise, when life is all over in this world, we're not going to just go to another plane. We'll have a physical existence in the new heavens and the new earth. A better life will begin because Jesus gets the last word. The question for you today is who will have the last word in your life? In your life. In your life. You remember Joan Crawford said on her deathbed, don't you dare ask God to help me. Sadly, that's the way someone lives their entire lives. They live their entire lives that way. When Joseph Addison, an 18th century playwright, and poet, and politician, said, said his last words, his life wasn't always easy. Some close to him uh, didn't treat him well. He was often criticized by others. He struggled with health problems most of his life, but he is. Not all there is. He, but he said, no problem, no enemy, not even death will have the last word. Do you know what the final words were on his deathbed? His final words were this. See in what peace a Christian can die. Those words can be yours because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you something more. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, while we await the final day of resurrection of our bodies, we can also say, see in what peace a Christian can live in this life. That's because we do not have to fear anything that life brings our way. No virus, no pandemic, no death, no war, no crime, nothing do we need to fear. Your trials and troubles and tribulations will not have the last word. Jesus does. Your sin in your life that has created havoc in your life does not have the last word. Jesus does. And death will not have the last word, the so-called final enemy, over you. Because Jesus has the last word over life, over sin, and over death. For this reason, I say to you today, I implore you today, give him your last words. What will they be? I know what mine will be. Jesus 
really had the last words. He has risen from the grave. Heavenly Father, thank you today. Pray for everyone who heard this message. If they heard this message and have been convicted of their sin, Father, I pray that you would woo them and draw them to yourself today. I pray for those without faith in Christ that you would, be, you would grant them by your sovereign power the gift of faith. That they would turn from their sins and trust you as their Lord and Savior and Master of their life. And Father, I pray that they would get in touch with our church. Uh, you, can, you can leave a comment in the, in the um, section below as you're watching this. Uh, you can call the church office. Uh, just encourage you. Uh, to, to, to be involved and to don't let this decision go by any longer. For Jesus truly has the last word because of the resurrection. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.